So this is our keynote presentation for everyone who's joining us. Um, we're delighted to have Joan Lippincott, um, who's going to talk about making connections, um, ETDs, academe, and the world of work. And so before we start off here, I would just like to give a brief introduction because Joan really deserves it. She has been a huge supporter of ETDs over the years. So Joan Lippincott is Associate Executive Director Emerita of the Coalition for Networked Information, or CNI, a joint program of the Association of Research Libraries, ARL, and EDUCAUSE, based in Washington, D.C. At CNI, Joan provide, uh, provided leadership for programs in teaching and learning, learning spaces, digital scholarship, ETDs, and assessment. She served on the boards of the Networked Digital, Li Digital Library Theses and Dissertations, NDLTD, um, the New Media Consortium, NMC, and on the advisory boards for the Horizon Report, um, both uh, higher education and libraries. Um, Joan was the editor of EDUCAUSE Review um, e-Content column, chair of the Association of the College and Research Libraries, ACRL, New Publications Board, and served as a member of the ACRL um, uh, ACRL task force that produced the framework for information literacy in higher education. In addition to serving on the advisory boards of the Learning Spaces Collaboratory and the Learning Space Toolkit Project, Joan has served as a consultant to many academic libraries for their space renovation projects and has been on the planning committee um, for the Designing Libraries for the 21st Century Conference since its inception. So please help me to welcome Dr. Joan Lippincott. Thank you so much, John, and just give me a minute to get my slides up. Great, I hope that looks good, not, yeah, great. Thanks for the kind introduction, John, and thank you and the program committee for the invitation to keynote this virtual conference. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I attended, I sat in on the first session uh, where many of you might have been wearing your pajama bottoms, but you certainly weren't wearing them in, on top, um, but you really looked great and sound like you're adapting really well to working from home or in some cases on campus during this pandemic. And now that I'm retired, I am working from home and enjoying it as well as generally being retired. So my talk today is about the role of all of us in preparing graduate students, and this applies to both masters and PhD students, although my emphasis will be on the latter, for their careers, whether in academe or otherwise. While the ETD is often seen as the culmination in a student's preparation to enter the scholarly conversation of a discipline, to use the words of the ACRL Information Literacy Framework, does that exercise prepare students today as well as it might have, let's say, 30 years ago? My answer would be, it depends. My organization, the Coalition for Networked Information, as John noted, is a joint program of a library and IT organization. We have a wealth of open access materials on our website, videos, PowerPoints, papers, articles, on virtually every topic I'll touch on in my talk today, and I invite you to explore our resources. You'll note that in the examples that I use on my slides, I've given the URLs so that you can go to explore these uh, resources on your own. I have already submitted my slides and they've been uploaded to the conference website so you'll all have access to them. CNI was one of the co-hosts in the early 1990s of, of the meetings in the early 1990s that led to the development of the Network Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations, or NDLTD. And I don't need to date myself now that I'm retired. Um, I'm old. And I was present at most of those early meetings and then on the board of the NDLTD for many years. I've always been interested in ETDs as a way to develop our new generation of scholars and professionals and introduce them to all kinds of new concepts and new ways of doing research and presenting their research in the digital environment. Many newly minted 
PhDs and master's students have faced a challenging job market for years. This seems to be widely known about humanities students, but there are many disciplines in the sciences and social sciences too, where students struggle to find an entry level professional job in their field. With the coronavirus and resulting economic impact, the prospects for our graduate students are even worse. In terms of academic positions for new PhDs, many universities have hiring freezes and furloughs. This situation is also very difficult in nonprofits, government agencies, and many businesses. At this critical time, it is even more important than ever to do our best for our graduate students in preparing them for the job market. What will make them more marketable and Whose responsibility is it to provide them with opportunities to succeed? I think it's likely that every participant in this virtual conference is aware that only a fairly, fairly small percentage of PhDs will become full-time higher education faculty in tenure track positions. Most of them, along with our master's level students, will find employment in government, nonprofits, business, communications fields, and some of them will find non-faculty positions, for example, in academic advising or IT in universities, but not in tenure track positions. Some research faculty think that taking positions outside of academe is a mark of failure for PhD uh, graduates. But does our community and do the graduate students themselves agree with that perspective? Would they think that a position as a program manager or scientist at NASA or the head of the Smithsonian were not as prestigious as a faculty position? And is prestige really the issue? In the Chronicle for Higher Education's Trends Report 2020, they identified new rules for the PhD as one of their trends. They I, I'm quoting, in the past several years, PhD programs have started to recognize and communicate to their students that non-academic careers are legitimate. Now a movement to rewrite the rules of graduate training is gathering steam. Are you seeing this at your own institution or perhaps in some departments or schools or colleges at your own institution? Specifically, the report states, progressive departments backed by foundation and federal government money are granting credit for activities that wouldn't have counted toward the doctorate in the past. Collaborations with organizations off campus, portfolios instead of comprehensive exams, courses for scientists on the business side of research. A podcast, a rap album, or a comic book instead of a traditional dissertation. I would be really interested to know if some of you have examples of those as accepted dissertations at your institutions. And I can think of some other uh, types of alternative dissertations, for example, that include data visualizations or a piece of software that the graduate student has developed but often these would be components of a dissertation and not the entire work. The National Institutes of Health Broadening Experiences in Scientific Training or BEST program issued grants in 2012 and 2013 for institutions to develop innovative approaches to provide biomedical PhD students a means to shift toward preparation for a wider range of career options than academic positions as a complement to traditional training. Faculty state that they actively discuss non-academic career opportunities with trainees, and they call graduate students trainees, but a majority of faculty indicate that they themselves do not have a good knowledge of the skills needed in non-academic fields. There are a number of reports from this BEST program, and in one it makes this statement, which I believe is critically important. 
there is a need to enhance the doctoral experience to meet the developing needs for our knowledge-driven economies. To me, this means that students need to be adept in finding, analyzing, and using data, as well as designing data collection activities, for example. In addition, the report states, and I'm quoting, while faculty generally recognize that trainees need to develop skills that are applicable to careers inside and outside of academia, they had mixed opinions as to whether they were confident in their own knowledge of these skills and the ability to keep trainees informed about fields different from academe. The report concluded, as such, there is a mismatch between the perceived urgency in career development training for biomedical scientists and an individual faculty member's ability to provide such training. And it's not just in the sciences that national bodies recognize the importance of a variety of skills for graduates to augment their disciplinary knowledge. Here are the Career Diversity Five, as developed by the American Historical Association. I particularly emphasize the first one, the need for communication skills in a variety of media, and the last one on digital literacy for students to have a basic familiarity with the digital tools and platforms. But I would suggest, alternatively, a working knowledge not a basic familiarity, but a working knowledge of some digital tools and platforms. Now I'd like to focus on the core of my talk, and that's on four specific areas of skills that I believe are important for all graduate students and that tie directly into their preparation for developing an ETD. They are first, employing digital tools and data management practices, Second, making choices within the scholarly communication system. Third, understanding reputation management. And fourth, communicating research findings to the public. So starting with the digital tools and data management practices, are you aware of how widely, for example, GIS or geographical information systems and data visualization tools are being used in the disciplines. Historians, archeologists, public health researchers, and biologists, and many more use GIS and data visualization to both analyze data and present the results of their research. These tools and others allow researchers to ask new kinds of questions, particularly when approaching large data sets. Please note that when I use the term data, I include such things as text as data, image and audio collections, seismic information, astronomical data, and many, many more forms and subjects. Graduate students should be introduced to and have practice using the tools that are most used by researchers in their field. And I really want to stress that I don't believe that students should learn about technology for technology itself. It shouldn't be divorced from their subject discipline or activities such as teaching or communication that are uh, important in their discipline. It is becoming increasingly important for all researchers to practice good data management and it's a requirement in many grant, uh, grant, uh, grants issued by governments and uh, private foundations. Understanding good data management will be important for students entering careers in government, nonprofits, and business as well. It's not just for academic research. Now, for each of these topics, I'll be providing some examples of programs. If your own institution has an exemplary program or resource, web resource, in any of these areas, I urge you to put the URL into the chat window and share it with the other participants in this online conference. So here's my first example. In the fall of 2018, the Columbia University Libraries 
coordinated the rollout of a new campus-wide program to provide students with access to instruction in the fundamentals of computational literacy, filling the gap between formal course credit offerings and do-it-yourself approaches, Foundations for Research Computing is the result of a multi-year, multi-stakeholder effort to respond to a need for elemental research computing knowledge as a graduate student core competency. Supported by the graduate schools, campus IT, the Office of Research and the Libraries, Foundations for Research Computing translates a faculty-led vision for critical instructional intervention into several coordinated services and initiatives, actively assessing program success along the way. Through intensive boot camps, workshops, lectures, and peer consultation opportunities, Columbia students receive novice to intermediate assistance in the use of computational approaches, tools, and infrastructure. The presenters of this session at a CNI meeting said they have a waiting list of graduate students for every program they offer and you can find out more about this exemplary program on the CNI website. Another session at a CNI meeting described various programs at UCLA, University of Rhode Island, University of Pittsburgh, and NYU about teaching artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital humanities, natural language processing, and virtual reality. There is a video presentation if you'd like to learn more. This web capture from Virginia Tech Libraries shows the range of data services and resources available to their students and faculty. So they do data consulting, they help people write data management plans, statistics, consulting, connecting them with things like the open science framework, etc. And I do think it's really important that they make this available for graduate students and not just faculty. And this data visualization toolkit from University of Minnesota libraries is intended to assist others in jumpstarting their own program. The Georgia Tech Library highlights the value and processes for open data. So, providing workshops, training programs, web resources, toolkits, and other mechanisms assist graduate students in gaining skills in these areas. Note that none of these things are explicitly included in students' graduate academic programs, although that may be the case in some institutions. And some institutions are developing certificate programs for graduate students, focusing on technology skills in the disciplines as an adjunct to their degree. Another, another area that's growing rapidly is the development of cross-disciplinary data science programs. And I noticed, uh, and I don't know if he's still uh, on the uh, web conference, that Michael Witt from Purdue was uh, attending, and he's part of the development of such a data science program at that institution. And I think that's an emerging trend. The next area I'd like to discuss involves making choices in the scholarly communication system. You don't have to be a faculty member to contribute to the literature or communicate ideas related to your research. So this is relevant to students beyond those who do become academic faculty. While for each of the broad topics I'm covering this afternoon, I could present for an hour or more, here are three topics I'd like to emphasize in this area. What are your graduate students being taught about the acceptability of various digital formats for communicating research in their field? Are graduate students able to identify publication targets for their work? Are students genuinely informed about intellectual property issues for their own and for the use of others' work? Sorry.
In contrast to the Chronicle article I mentioned earlier, most students would not be permitted to do a comic book or podcast as their dissertation, although perhaps they would be allowed by their committee to include those components in a standard text dissertation, or perhaps in a creative writing program, a comic book might be an acceptable thesis. I've long admired the NDLTD Innovation Dissertation Award since it recognizes those students who make an effort to push the envelope with the format of what's included in their dissertations. In this particular case, it's a video, which isn't perhaps um, the most technologically uh, and, uh, unusual, but it is a really important element in this uh, PhD student's graduate work in education. Often faculty advisors in many disciplines are very conservative about what they think of as publication or acceptable publication. And I think it's important for information professionals in particular to point the way to alternative forms of presenting research that come from very reputable sources, such as the Stanford University Press. This is just one of many examples I could have used. And this is a really detailed, um, media-rich uh, website about a burial site um, in Egypt, an ancient burial site. I found it astonishing to, to read on listservs about faculty seeking redress after they've been bamboozled uh, by disreputable journal publishers or just asking advice on where to publish an article. I imagine many librarians assume that this advice usually comes from students graduate advisor or committee, but this is not necessarily true. The Tufts University Library recognizes this and provides a guide for finding a journal to publish in. And Cornell provides a guide on how to go about open access publishing, including where to publish and including author rights resources. And SPARC provides advice and many resources for researchers, libraries, and others. One of their staff is active in the OpenCon movement, which specifically enlists students in becoming aware of and advocates for open access. The Harvard Library has a copyright advisory service for students as well as faculty as well as really nice resources, many using rich graphic formats. My next topic is reputation management. Do many graduate students even understand what this means in the professional sense? Again, this is not just important for those going into academic careers. Researchers working in government, nonprofits, and business, too, will want to be aware of their professional reputation management uh, options. They should understand the role, for example, that identity management plays in reputation management. I will give some examples of specific products in this and subsequent sections of my talk, and I'm not endorsing or showing preference for any. They serve as examples. You'll note on this slide that in addition to uh, linking, showing a, a web capture from the ORCID website, for, on, which of course relates to identity management, I'm also uh, linking to a presentation of the use of ORCID by individuals early in their career. And I know there will be presentations on ORCID in this conference as well. Should graduate students be exposed to systems that can gather together information on their publications and their citations? Should they understand the benefits and drawbacks and differences of these systems, such as Scopus and Google Scholar, and of course there are others? Do they understand impact factor? And for those pursuing academic careers, how important that can be in promotion and tenure decisions, rightly or wrongly. This is a guide from University of Illinois, Chicago on that topic. What other tools can they use to track the impact of their research and what kinds of things do they want to track? Kudos and altmetrics, are mechanisms for tracking a wider impact than academic citations. 
This is an online challenge for Ohio State faculty, postdocs, and graduate students designed to help them enhance the impact and visibility of their research. Each day during a particular week, participants receive an email with one or two tasks to complete that will help them to enhance their scholarly profile, along with links to instructions and advice for completing them. A nice, e a nice idea, easily replicated in other institutions. And by the way, I do not know if Ohio State initiated uh, this kind of research impact challenge or uh, if others did. And please indicate in the chat if you have an answer to, to that. And who's talking directly and honestly to graduate students about their social media presence, both related to the research and otherwise. A program from the University of Washington Graduate Schools provides some resources. And now to my final section and then to my wrap up. Communicating research to the public is important for so many reasons and we see the effects of both good and poor communication related to the coronavirus every day. When the library at American University hosted its first annual conference on high impact research, 125 faculty showed up, by far their largest attendance at any event they had held. The conference highlighted the significant and changing role of the scholar as policy influencer and public intellectual helping the faculty fulfill a funding agency's requirement to connect their research to the citizen public was a theme throughout. This would be a great event for graduate students as well. And again, we have a video of that presentation uh, from CNI. I found this Ophthalmology Association Fellowship in the UK for postdocs, which emphasizes the importance of communicating research to the public. This is an excellent role for societies, but these topics should not wait until after graduation. And this podcast series at University of Michigan provides graduate students in history there with an opportunity to mine the archives and present an informative view of a topic in audio format. It's a useful way for humanists to learn to translate their often narrow specialties into interesting ideas for the public. The pioneering digital historian Ed Ayers, formerly at University of Virginia and then president at University of Richmond, is a master of this type of work in history. I was introduced to the three minute thesis program at a US ETDA conference in Washington a few years ago. Students gave great summaries, in one case, a truly brilliant summary of their dissertation research in three minutes. Developed at the University of Queensland, the three-minute thesis competition cultivates students' academic presentation and research communication skills and increases their capacity to effectively explain their research in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience. Is your institution participating in this? I want to wrap up with a few thoughts. And I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. So if you want, please start typing them into the chat and uh, really want to have a dialogue with you and learn from your own experiences. So has the purpose and function of the dissertation changed in the last 30 years? What do you think the dissertation experience should provide? Not just the final product, but all that leads up to it. Are the kinds of skills and capabilities I've emphasized in this presentation being taken into account at your institution? And this is my challenge to you. Can we provide our graduate students with a systematic education in areas that are important for future scholars and professionals? All of this may sound good to you, but how will it come about, evolve, and grow? It takes individuals, departments, and programs 
to actually make these things a reality. So who has responsibility for education in these areas? And that may be distributed across your institution. Who will advocate for incorporating these skills into graduate school education? You need some faculty on board and not just those in ancillary units um, within the higher ed organization. Who would be responsible for implementing programs and funding them or allocating staff time to these programs? And is there good outreach to graduate students to heighten awareness of availability? And that goes for what you're already offering as well as what you might offer in the future. So moving forward, I encourage you to develop an institutional strategy. This is not a graduate school issue. It's not a library issue. Uh, it's not a research office issue. It's an institutional issue. So bring together interested parties from cross campus. Survey what's currently available. It's possible there's more than you realize. Develop plans, priorities, capabilities, and responsibilities. Seek support. Who might kick in some money for this or allocate some staff time? And communicate in as many ways that you can think of. Leverage the work that has been done by the other institutions. Use some of the examples. Contact those institutions. Ask permission to adapt, modify, or adopt full scale some of the tutorials or guides or other resources that they have created. And then there absolutely is a need for staff. There, people uh, need time to develop all of these kinds of initiatives. And in many cases, you would need to rewrite job descriptions to include responsibility for some priority areas for resources for graduate students. Collaborate. There is lots to be done. So I've listed some of the potential collaborators. Many of you participating in this conference are already collaborating among several of these groups. And if I've missed some other organizations within your university or other units, I'd love to hear which other units you're collaborating with related to ETDs and graduate education. And finally, in these uncertain times, we owe it to our graduate students to provide a full education that prepares them for the workplace. What actions can you take to make this a reality at your institution? Thank you very much. And I have left plenty of time for questions. I'm going to stop my sharing so I can see the chat window. And I'm hoping that um, we'll see some questions and comments in the chat. So also collaborating with the Career Center, Center, that's a really good one. Collaborating with ProQuest, absolutely. John, any questions in the chat? Oh, I was just looking through the chat window myself. And thank you very much, Joan. That was um, most enlightening. And I think you have the knack for finding the most unusual, interesting experimental programs around the nation and around the world and showcasing them and showing people how they can implement that on their campuses. So at the beginning of the chat here, um, we had a question from Larry Tagg. He said, uh, PhD students often do not address the question that surround their um, use of both methodology and instrumentation. Why do they use specific instrumentation or research methods? Are there alternative alternatives? Um, there is, in most cases, an absence of the quantitative and qualitative value uh, discussions of instruments and methods within the, their research topics. Did you have anything? I'm going to take a moment since it's a fairly uh, there are several parts to the question. Yes. I found it in the chat, and I'm going to read it myself. So give Thank me you. just a moment. Absolutely. Okay, so the, the absence of 
really boils down to, I think, the absence of quantitative and qualitative value discussions of instruments and methods within their topics of research. And this can have implications for how the data is collected and presented and how it might be preserved for, and for future reuse um, and rep for replicability and, and reuse of their data. So I think in this kind of instance, then it will take people working in, whether it's the IT organization, the library organization, or the uh, research office, to work with specific departments or colleges on what are the kinds of instruments um, or methods that uh, are either acceptable or uh, prioritized or preferred. Um, this would be, to me, uh, I think similar to the question, say, in the humanities of what software to use or whether to create new projects um, with new tools that are not used by anyone else and therefore very hard to preserve for the long term. So those kinds of issues need to be raised um, in, in every uh, discipline, but I think it takes a joint discussion between faculty researchers, graduate students, IT or data specialists, and librarians. I hope that addresses your question. Oh, that's very comprehensive. Um, on the topic of preservation, I just wanted to ask, what is your gut feeling of, this, of the state of preservation, digital preservation these days, and uh, where are we going with it? Are you concerned? Well, I think that we're in reasonably good state for digital preservation of relatively mainstream kinds of digital publications, particularly things like e-journals um, with some, you know, with large international projects of working um, in those arenas. I think that there are many questions about preservation of alternative forms or new media forms or uh, born digital forms uh, of preservation. Now, for example, I don't know what the preservation strategy is for the site that I showed you that's done by Stanford University Press, but since they are also one of the leaders in digital preservation, I imagine that that was part of the development of that project. And so I think that um, the challenges are in the, uh, the new formats. What, what I believe is that rather than um, trying to, to view it as discouraging researchers from using new formats in their research or in the presentation of their research results, we do have a responsibility to educate them about what we think about the long-term preservation possibilities for those formats. For some researchers, it may not be important that their results can't be displayed, let's say, after five years. For others, that would be critically important. And so we need to do a good job of educating our user communities about what we can and cannot preserve at this point. Oh, great, great. And I think, too, there's a lot of responsibility within specific disciplines, depending on the kind of data and um, yeah. um, things that they use. They often develop their own best um, practices and approaches. And so I think it's important to pay attention to that. Um, at the beginning of the chat, there was a link that was posted, um, I think, by Ashley to the Stanford program that you referenced. So everybody can check that out. Um, I'm going to try and scroll Thank through you. here. Sure. Real quickly. Um, Terry, um, Green had a question about author rights. Oh, she just said students also need to sound uh, need sound guidance on publishing issues, intellectual property, and author rights. Uh, yes, and I probably shortchanged that a bit in my presentation. I used the example from Harvard about their consultation service and their guides. There are many, many uh, programs out there that deal with. Um, intellectual property issues. I think there are a lot of good tutorials and a lot of good guides that have been developed 
by libraries or libraries in collaboration with their uh, legal offices on campus or perhaps with the graduate school. And I think that it's important that uh, students particularly understand that they're both users of others' intellectual property and that they're creators of new intellectual property. And they understand the advantages and disadvantages of uh, using creative, copy, uh, creative Commons licenses, for example. Uh, they need to understand their choices within those licenses and how, um, how they want to view their own work. And uh, I think there, there is a lot of education in that arena going on and I strongly encourage that. Great. Um, I'm just scrolling through the remainder of the, I, I don't have any, I don't think I have any additional questions. There are a lot of interesting resources people have posted about things they're doing on their campus. So thank you for doing that. Worthy. I really yeah. appreciate it. And we'll scrape the comments out and save them for the, for later viewing. Great. Um, yeah, and so we've got five minutes here. Actually, um, I think maybe we could open this up to the floor if we can try to keep it orderly. Um, I don't see, Heidi, a hand raise option in my options here, but um, it, people can either um, ask us in the chat window, ask your question, or if you want to unmute, maybe we'll be bold and just as, if somebody wants that to, and not, not everybody at once. Yes. So um, we'll open the floor to the audience. I'll give a second here. Sometimes it takes people a moment to uh, react. I Go ahead. I think this is a question. Uh, suggestions for when institutional departments like Student Affairs or Career Center are really focused on undergraduates. Do we build a graduate specific resource center and service? And I do think that perhaps the assumption is that most of this goes on in schools and departments for graduate students. But I think that that's not the case. And I think that um, for, uh, I would imagine many graduate students, uh, many students who have uh, masters and PhDs who are participating in this conference are really well aware that in their own programs, there was uh, barely any career guidance given or really uh, career opportunities. In my own case, um, it, it was really in, internships, which were a requirement of the program that I've considered about the only uh, helpful or useful uh, piece of career development that I received in my years of uh, doctoral education. And in terms of my master's education, it was virtually non-existent. So I do, I would support myself um, graduate specific resource centers, but this will vary by institution. Perhaps some institutions have strong guidance or it would be best if a collaborative program were developed uh, between the um, departments and the schools and colleges. Very good. Okay, I just got a note that if we open up participants, we can see hand raise and not Sure, I know what I'm That's looking for That's interesting at Iowa. They've thought about an agreement form that students might use to ensure their understanding and elections for digital preservation of their work. And that's, that's great that to use something to engage them in actually thinking about those issues. <clears throat> great. Um, I saw Terry had her video window open. I, Terry, did, did you have a question you wanted to ask Terry Green? No, no. It actually, uh, several of my questions were already addressed, so um, I'm good. Thanks. Uh, I would like to go to this one. We, cre we can create all the workshops and resources, but how do we get our students to sign up for those workshops and learn from those re resources? That's a really good question. And I remember attending a presentation at a totally different conference where uh, some presenters talked about their graduate uh, workshop program and talked about how successful it was. And it turned out that only three to five students were attending these sessions. And this was from a very large research university. So I wondered, what are the criteria for success? Now you contrast that with a program at Columbia where they're, you know, 
the graduate students are beating down the doors to get into these um, technology intensive, data intensive kinds of workshops. And so I might suggest that maybe the emphasis uh, needs to change of some of these programs that perhaps doing something related to data or, or uh, related to say uh, machine learning or something like that and then augmenting that in the same workshop with something related to digital preservation or um, intellectual property related to data or whatever might be one way of getting more participation. I'd also note that from uh, one of the previous sessions, my impression was that your online services during the pandemic are being very well used at many institutions, including your tutorials and other things that you used to do in person. And I think that often has to do with graduate students' schedules. They often want to do things at night or on the weekend, which isn't necessarily when you're doing your workshops or your consultations. And so having that flexibility and having that, um, the availability of using those tutorials or other things at any time may also be an answer for getting more people to those resources. But I do believe that many units, and I know libraries best, under promote or don't have really good promotion strategies for what they offer. And that is institution specific, but it really does require understanding the needs of uh, specific programs, the graduate students in those programs, they may have their own communication devices, whether it's a list for, serve a Facebook, Facebook group or Snapchat or whatever it is um, that you could use to promote some of uh, your um, workshops and, and other materials. That would be something from my point of view and putting my assessment hat on, do some focus groups with graduate students to find out what are what they think. There's not going to be one best way. There are gonna be multiple ways that you need to communicate these things to graduate students. I see I'm at time, Great. John, so I don't yes. wanna go on too long, so. Yes, wonderful. We could go on all day with this. You've been just fabulous. Thank you so much, Joan. Uh, everybody, thank you. Let's clap for um, Joan. And um, Heidi, we're gonna be looking for um, Terry Robinson to do a poster session. Um, in the next segment here, um, and then we'll go into breakout sessions again at um, 3.15. So. Thank you, John, and thank you to the program committee and for all of the attention and great questions and comments and resources from the participants. I really enjoyed being here with you today. Thanks. Great. Thank you.